Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're glad that you're joining us. You can start signing in as I am signing in myself to some of these other uh, pages that we like to share uh, our broadcast with. Uh, you can be doing that as well if you have a page that uh, of which you are a member that allows you to share a video uh, like we have tonight, then please do so and uh, share the link or start a watch party um, <clears throat> and invite your friends uh, to join uh, the watch party. Uh, we're going to take up here in just a few minutes uh, where we left off last week. We had told everyone that we would come back and uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. So we're going to you're going to be there in just a moment. Uh, if I can get this to come up on the delay uh, on on the the page, it looks like I'm as usual. I'm having trouble, but that shouldn't stop you all from from signing in. And we're going to get started here in just a second. We're glad that you're with us tonight, and we hope that you will uh, continue to join us. Well. I'm going to have to do something else here. Let's see if I can uh, do this and get us going on uh, the website. Well, I, did I put this on the wrong page? Let's see if I did that. I've been known to do that before, to uh, uh, get us on the wrong uh, page. And uh, so we don't want to have to start over again. Uh, and we'll see, but I, I just don't think that's the case. Uh, yes, it is the case. So the feed is on uh, the Jeff Asher page tonight, and I've, I've made a mistake. It's, it's not uncommon for me. Uh, so let me just do this real quick here and get over there, and then I should be able to share uh, this very quickly. Yes. All right. So there we go. And like I said, if you would please do the same and share this with the various pages or groups of which you are a member that allow you to do so, then we'll be off to a running start here now in just a few uh, seconds. And so uh, we're, we're again, let me say here that we're glad that you're here tonight and we hope that you have your questions. I'm I really would like for you all to to ask a few more questions uh, of me than than you've been. I, I appreciate the fact that you let me preach because I like preaching, but uh, really the program is designed to answer questions and that helps us build an audience because a lot of people out there uh, with a lot of questions themselves and so by you asking questions that encourages them uh, to also, ask questions and, and see that we can deal with their question in such a way as that we'll be able to to help them and to not uh, intimidate them I hope so that's that's our goal and so please uh, <clears throat> get involved in that tonight uh, by uh, sharing the page and uh, submitting your questions I had said just a moment ago uh, that we're going back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, we had a question come in last week it was kind of uh, an outlier and I delayed answering it till later in the program and I really didn't have the time to, to, to answer the question like I wanted to and after the broadcast tonight I will post a uh, chart like I did a couple of weeks ago uh, on 1 Corinthians 15. But the question was, and, 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 and has, has a little background behind it, uh, there are a lot, a lot of folks taking some, some peculiar views on 1 Corinthians 15. And if you've been in my Bible class on 1 Corinthians, and when we've come to chapter 15, I have been kind of um, noncommittal on verse 50 and so when this brother asked the question I felt like well it's time for me to get back in the book and make up my mind as to what this passage is saying 
Now, 1 Corinthians 15, just taken by itself, verse 50, simply says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, basically two views on the passage. One, uh, the passage is saying that there must be a transformation, a change that takes place uh, in the resurrection that brings our material or our corruptible body into a state that is incorruptible. And that's what the passage says. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So when we talk about the resurrection, and we talk about the resurrection of the body, some people think, well, you're, are you saying that that old rotting corpse uh, is going into heaven? No one believes that knows anything about the New Testament anyway. No one believes that a, a rotting, putrefied corpse is going into heaven. That's the whole point of resurrection. We're going to show that here in just a moment. That's the whole point of resurrection, that there is a transformation of, of that which is corruptible into that which is incorruptible. Now, the issue in the resurrection is understanding the identity between the body that is buried and the body that is raised, or as Paul expresses it, that which is sown and that which is raised. In Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus as the first begotten from the dead. So, when you and I obeyed the gospel, we were born again, we were regenerated, and that was our spirit that was regenerated. We were forgiven of our sins, and we became children of God. But the reality is, is that we still died physically. Our bodies grew old, will grow old, they may become diseased, and we will eventually die unless we are alive when Christ returns. And 1 Corinthians 15 deals with that possibility. And so, but the vast majority of us that have lived, and I'm talking all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the vast majority of humanity has died. And they will be in the grave, their bodies will be in the grave when Jesus returns and he will call them forth. This is John chapter 5. 28 and 29, that those who are in the grave will hear his voice and they will come forth, uh, the righteous unto uh, eternal life and the wicked unto eternal condemnation. So at the second coming of Christ, there will be a judgment that will separate the sheep from the goats, the, right, the, the unrighteous from the righteous, the wicked from the righteous. And the righteous will be clothed upon with immortality. Now, this is what you need to think about if you're struggling with this, is the reality. Paul makes it clear, and we're going to read the, the verses here in just a moment. But Paul makes it clear that that which is corruptible shall put on incorruptible, and that which is in, that which is mortal shall put on immortality. Now, the spirit of man has never been mortal. The Apostle Paul is not talking about a change that's going to take place within or upon our spirits. Our spirits have been born again, and we have been cleansed of sin, and we are awaiting the resurrection of the dead. And so that which is mortal and that which is corruptible in this passage is the body. And that body, this body, is going to be changed. We will all be changed in a twinkling of an eye, of an eye Paul says. It's in an imperceptible moment. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and that which is mortal, well, what was mortal? Not my spirit, but my body. The mortal body will put on immortality. This body will be changed to become immortal. And that which is corruptible, what, what sees corruption? This body goes to corruption. My spirit doesn't go to corruption. My spirit doesn't cease to exist. It doesn't disintegrate. It doesn't go into non-existence no longer perceptible as a spirit, my body goes to corruption to the point that it is no longer perceptible as a body. 
it goes to the dust. Uh, the Lord said in, in Genesis chapter 3. And we know that's the case. And so the body is what's being talk, spoken of in this passage, not the spirit. That's what's going to be changed. And that's why we emphasize in, in reading through the passage, the it that is sown is the it that is raised. What is raised? The body is raised. But it is not raised mortal. It is not raised corruptible. It is raised immortal. It is raised incorruptible. Someone says, well, I don't like the way my body looks. Well, I, I, I'm not going to stand here and argue with you how your body is going to look. And, and I'm sorry if you don't like the way it looks, but let me tell you something. I know I'm not the best looking fella, but if the Lord can change what I have right now to be immortal, and incorruptible, and that I will no longer be pulled by sin, and I can live forever in the eternal presence of God in heaven, I don't care what I look like. Why would you? It's, it, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard anybody say as an objection to the resurrection, that you're concerned about how you're going to look. That is the last thing about which I am concerned. Someone says, well, you don't seem to be too concerned about it now. Well, that may be the case. But the reality is, the Lord is going to give me an incorruptible, immortal body that will live forever in his presence in heaven. I will have eternal life. Now, let's get over here into 1 Corinthians 15, and then we're going to start taking your questions on this subject. Now the context actually uh, begins at verse 35. We've been talking about the resurrection of Jesus in the first 34 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. And that's very important. What was raised with regard to Jesus? His body was raised. You get over there in Acts chapter 2 and Peter says, this same Jesus whom you have crucified. Well what what did they drive the nails into? Upon what did they place the crown of thorns? What did they beat with that scourge? Into what did the centurion plunge his spear? Well, it was the body of Jesus. And so we're talking about this same Jesus whom you have crucified hath God raised up. And so the Spirit of Christ came back into his body, and that body which appeared to the, the twelve and to the women and to uh, James, the Lord's brother, and to 500 witnesses at one time, and finally to the Apostle Paul as one who was born out of due season. That's all expressed in the first 11 verses of this chapter. That was the body of Jesus. And so they all saw the same thing. And it, let me tell you something. If Paul did not see what Peter and the eleven saw and what the women saw and all the other witnesses saw, then Paul is a liar and he's not an apostle. And so what Paul saw on the road to Damascus was the same Jesus that the rest of them had seen. And that was the Jesus who came forth from the grave. That's the Jesus of whom Thomas said, I will not believe unless I can place my fingers into the prints of the nails in his hands and I can thrust my hand into the wound in his side. And when Jesus appeared to him, he said, Thomas, come hither, be no longer faithless, but believing. Place here your fingers into the prints of the nails in my hands and thrust hither your hand into my side. Now, was Jesus just making conversation? You need, we need to think about that. That's who they saw. And when he appeared to the eleven on that first occasion there in Luke uh, chapter 23, Jesus said to them, Here, see, handle me. It is I, and I get this, it is I myself. What does that mean? Jesus was the same person. Was he a rotting, putrefying corpse? God forbid. 
He was the resurrected Son of God. He had been clothed upon with immortality, and he had now become incorruptible. Now, this is the point. All those first 34 verses are designed to show us how we shall be in the resurrection. And so there in verse 34, to encourage us to persevere unto the resurrection, Paul says, awake unto righteousness and sin not. He says what you need to do is get busy about living a righteous life, a life of faith in service unto Jesus Christ. Now then, verse 35, he says, but some man's going to say, well, with what body? How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? To who come? The dead that are raised up. Now, notice there in verse 50, before I get too far here, you have two things set in opposition. He says, he says brethren, I say to you, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So you have flesh and blood on one hand, you have the kingdom of God on the other hand. Those two things are set in opposition. And then he says, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So corruption and flesh and blood are analogous to one another. They're, they're speaking about the same thing. And the kingdom of God and incorruption are speaking about the same thing. Now I have toyed with the idea in the past that, that what the Apostle Paul here is saying is that just as one does not inherit the kingdom of God by birth, that is flesh and blood, so neither does the king neither does that which is corruptible inherit that which is incorruptible. Now, I don't think that does any harm to the context and I'm just telling you though I have finally realized in my own mind that throughout this whole section Paul is contrasting two things and when we get here to verse 50 in the light of the contrast from verse 35 forward it becomes apparent to me that these two things are set in opposition. And so, so corruption and flesh and blood are to be understood as being one thing, and the kingdom of heaven and incorruption are to be understood as at the, to the other two things that are alike. So these two things are set in opposition. The kingdom and flesh and blood. So in this context, flesh and blood is talking about a mater the, the material, corruptible human body. Not necessarily talking about a Jewish man, but just any human being who has died and been buried. That's what the whole context is about. Because verse... 35 says, how are the dead raised up? So flesh and blood refers to those who are dead. Flesh and blood is used in a lot of different ways in the New Testament. It's not my purpose tonight to go through and show all of these, but you could just do a concordance search or a, a search on your, uh, if you have one of those computerized Bibles, just do a search, flesh and blood, and see how many uh, ways it's used in the New Testament. Uh, when, when, when Paul says, uh, uh, there in Galatians chapter 1, he says uh, that he did not confer with flesh and blood. Well, in that passage, he's not talking about going out to the cemetery and talking to dead bodies. So in some passages, it may refer to, to a dead body. In other passages, it may refer to, to humanity in general. Context is going to determine... It, I think it pretty well always refers to humanity, but context is going to determine the actual limitation on what is being described. So some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And Paul responds to that question, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. Now, I like to garden. Some of you do as well. And you, you go down to, to, the, to the feed store, and you buy a package of seeds. And there'll be a pretty picture on the front of that of, of either a flower or 
uh, maybe some vegetable. We had squash tonight, really beautiful squash. And I've planted a lot of squash in, in my gardening days. But let me tell you something. When you open that package of seeds, what's inside that package does not look like the picture on the front of the package. Everybody knows that. And that's what Paul is saying here. When you look at this body, you look at that which will be sown. And that which will be sown is not that which is going to be raised. It's not, it's not the seed that comes up. What comes up is different, and that's what he says here. God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. And so here's a squash seed, and you put it into the ground, and after a few days it begins to sprout, and it comes up, and it's got those two little green leaves there, and then it begins to make a, a vine or maybe a plant, a squash plant, yellow squash, makes a plant. and then, But that still wasn't what was on the front of that envelope what was on the front of that envelope a big old yellow squash was on the front of that envelope that's what was on the front of that envelope big old yellow squash maybe it had a crook neck on it I, and, and 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 that's what we're looking for and it's after several days that maybe that flower that big orange flower comes out and then hopefully it sticks and what happens then it starts to put on that little bitty squash on the blossom end and then eventually you have on that vine you have what you had on that package and that's what paul is saying we all understand that. he says this is not what it's going to be in the resurrection he says now to prove this look there in verse 39 all flesh is not the same flesh but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and other of birds. And what's his point? That we have demonstrated in the creation all around us God's ability to make all kinds of bodies. Bird bodies, reptile bodies, fish bodies, some to live underwater, some to fly in the air, some to live under the ground, some to live on top of the ground. God has the ability to do it, do all kinds of things. So why, sh why are you marveling at this? There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. And he's not talking about the planets. The word celestial there in the King James means heavenly. There are bodies that are suited for heaven, and there are bodies that are suited for earth. Now, if God can make all these different kind of bodies for earth, then surely God can make a body for heaven. And so Paul says, there are celestial bodies and there are terrestrial bodies. And the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And there's one glory. Of, and now he goes, and so he says, they're different. They serve their purpose, but they're different. They each have their own glory because they're created by God. Then he goes on to talk about the planets. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And we even rank them that way. We'll talk about red stars and yellow stars and, and, and the fact that some are brighter than others and we give them ratings. We recognize that. And we realize the moon, because it's closer, even though it's reflected light, is brighter than the stars. I was out with a fellow today on a piece of land. He was talking about the fact that he had spent the night out on the property last night, and he lay there looking up. And for the first time in ages, he had actually seen the Milky Way. And the reason was because he was out in the middle of the country, and there wasn't a light bulb within a couple of miles. And so he was able to see what otherwise is dimmed when you're in town with all these lights. So we understand there's different glory, and so that's his point. And then he says in verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. So he's talking about the two glories and the difference and how that the resurrection body, the celestial body, the heavenly body, surpasses the terrestrial body in glory. How so? Because the terrestrial body is corruptible. But the heavenly body is incorruptible. 
this corruptible body dies, how, with what body do they come who? The dead. All right? So the dead are buried, their body goes to corruption, but it, what? The body is raised. God's going to change it. Don't ask me how. I don't know how. I'm not God. You see, some things begin and end with faith. Now, here's what the Bible says. The Bible gives us all the information we need. And the reality is, is God says that's what he's going to do. Now, this becomes a matter of faith. Do we believe what Paul says about it here? That this body is going to die. It's going to go to dust. And then God, when he returns, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to shout and the trumpet is going to sound and those who are in the graves are going to hear his voice and come forth. I don't know how he does it. I just know that he will do it because that's what he said he would do. And so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Now, understand there, natural body refers to this body. All right? It, this is natural. That's the same thing as saying terrestrial. All right? So the terrestrial body is the natural body, but he says the natural body is raised a spiritual body. He does not say it is raised a spirit. Please read that. It, what? The terrestrial body, which is corruptible, which is buried, which goes to dust, is raised, resurrected, what? It's resurrected a spiritual body. That doesn't mean it's a spirit. It means it's a body that's suited for a spirit. We're, we're, we're going to heaven. We're going to the... And so spirit, natural body is analogous to terrestrial, and spiritual is analogous to celestial. So a spiritual body is a heavenly body, not a planet but a body that is suited or fitted for heaven. And your spirit will reside in that body, and that's what makes it a spiritual body. It is a body suited for an eternal spirit, regenerated through faith in the death of Jesus Christ. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. That goes back to Genesis 2. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, or man, and he became a living soul. When the spirit that God gave to Adam joined with the body that God had made or formed from the dust, those two things together became a living soul. This is why it's so important that we understand resurrection. We are not who we are supposed to be if we do not have our body. And the body that God gave to Adam in the beginning when he breathed into him the breath of life and gave him access to the tree of life was a spiritual body. Do we not understand that? But once Adam sinned and he was denied access to the tree of life, then that body began to die. And so as a result of Adam's sin, death passed to all of us. And that's what he's saying here. Howbeit that was not first, oh, excuse me, I mean, need to finish verse 45. So it is written, first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam is Jesus Christ. Adam is the father of the race that fell into sin, and Jesus is the father of the race who is regenerated, forgiven of sin, through faith in him. And so the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam, Christ, was a life-giving spirit. We have eternal life through Christ, and eternal life involves not just the spirit being regenerated, eternal life involves the spirit 
joined with the resurrected body. That's what eternal life is. It's more than just eternal existence. Paul describes it there in Romans 2 as glory and honor, immortality. Then he says peace, eternal life. So the first man is of the earth, earthy. So you have the terrestrial, you have the earth, you have the earthy. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. And the Lord from heaven had an earthly body. And that earthly body was changed. And because his earthly body was changed, our earthly bodies can be changed if we have faith in him. So as is the earth earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And so this is, this is one reason, going back and looking at verse 48, is one reason why I've, I've realized that the, this contrast is continuing because heavenly, then what's the next thing he talks about? The kingdom of heaven. And notice here, the image of the heavenly, verse 49. As we have borne the image of the earthy, that's when we were in the kingdom of Satan. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly, the king of heaven, the son of God. And so we will bear his image. Where do we bear that image? In the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, the earthy, the natural. All right. So this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What is that? That's the heavenly. That's the celestial. Neither doth corruption. What is corruptible? The earthy. All right? Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We cannot go to heaven in this body in which we now reside. We can go to heaven if this body is changed, but this body will be changed only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins and the resurrection. All right, so we're, we're going to stop right there. I, I went a little too long. That's because I messed up at the front end. But uh, we, we can start taking your questions here. And I want to look at Brian, what Brian says here. He says, if God can make a man in the first place to dwell on the earth, why is it so difficult for people to fathom that God can supply us with a body for heaven in the resurrection? That is the very point that Paul is making, Brian. You are spot on. And let me go one step further here. This is exactly why men are want to attack the creation narrative. You know, we, we oftentimes do not realize how important the first few chapters of the book of Genesis are are if you if you just are are some salamander that crawled out of a pool of ooze that god did not fashion your father adam's body from the dust and brought to him your mother eve if that is not the truth then then there is no resurrection you see and so they attack the bible on the front end by attacking the creation. And then they attack the New Testament of the Gospels on the backside by denying the resurrection of Jesus. And yet these two things, the creation and the resurrection, are two things which are undeniable, which have stood every assault that men have made against them. And so you're like that fellow who was out in that car the other night Laying there looking up at the Milky Way, how could anybody not understand that the God of heaven created man, fashioned him out of the dust of the earth and breathed in him the breath of life and he became a living soul. And even though he sinned, God was not through with him. God still had an eternal purpose and that purpose involved his only begotten son, Jesus, who came to the earth and died for our sin and was raised from the dead. To give all of us who have been engulfed in sin the hope of actually being able to participate 
in the beauty of paradise as God first created it in the beginning. And if that's your hope, if that's your longing, then, then the resurrection from the dead is the thing that you want to embrace. But you cannot have the resurrection from the dead if you are not in Christ. You must have the first resurrection in order to experience that second resurrection. We've got another question there about 2 Corinthians, but before I do that, I want to make the, that point or show you that point from the scriptures. Look there at John 5. Right there in verse 24. Jesus says, He, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. All right, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'll tell you, verily, verily, or truly, truly. I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself. And he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And so Jesus, in coming, God gave him the authority to announce the conditions of salvation. And these conditions of salvation are shown to be, or, or described to us, under the figure of resurrection. So there is a first resurrection. Now when does that first resurrection occur? That first resurrection occurs in the new birth. When we are born of water and the Spirit. When we are baptized into Christ and raised, Romans chapter 6, we are raised to walk in newness of life. Now go on and read with me though, verse 28. Marvel not at this. Don't marvel that God will forgive your sins. It says, marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear their, his voice. There's something more marvelous than that. In verse 25, it's the dead. Dead what? Dead how? Dead in sin. All right? They're going to be raised. They're raised in Jesus Christ through their obedience to the gospel. He says, that's not all. There's more to it than that. Not only are you raised to walk in newness of life, but you have the hope there will be a time yet in the future. You have the hope of knowing that when your body goes to the grave, when your body turns to dust, you will hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good, those who've had this first resurrection, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, but they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. So those who have obeyed the gospel, trusted uh, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and been baptized into Jesus for the remission of their sins, they're raised to eternal life. They are raised to incorruption, immortality, honor, glory, power. But what about those who do not have the first resurrection? They're raised to eternal condemnation. They're cast into the second death, which is the lake of fire that was made for the devil and his angels. Now Brian asked another question, and this is really good. He says, what about 2 Corinthians 5? And this is very important to the point that I'm trying to make about the 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 idea of resurrection i don't know where this crept into the thinking of some of my brethren i see it in denominationalism quite frequently I, several years ago i went out to a, a funeral service a graveside service for one of the family members of uh, of a christian and this particular person was a member of a denomination and the preacher there was preaching and the fellow's body's laying right there in the casket and he says, this man's already been resurrected from the dead, and he's walking the streets of gold in heaven. And I thought to myself, what do you mean? I can see his body laying right there in the casket. He hasn't been raised to anything. He's still as dead as a hammer. I don't mean to be vile or, or vulgar or, or uh, unconcerned about that man. I'm just trying to get you to understand. that To talk about someone being raised while their body is still laying there in the casket is unscriptural. Resurrection involves the body coming forth from the grave and being changed. This body that we're in right now 
is going to be given life and in such a way, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 15, that it's going to be clothed upon with immortality, incorruption, power, honor, glory. And it's going to be like the body of Jesus that came forth from the grave uh, in the gospel accounts. That body of which Jesus said, as I mentioned a moment ago in, in, in Luke 23, touch me, handle me, see it as I myself. So realize that. Now here in 2 Corinthians 5, listen to what Paul says. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what's that describing? That's describing this body dying and going to dust. What, what, what would I have to say besides dissolved or talk about the dissolution of the body? The body goes back to dust. That's the dissolution of the body. That's the dissolving of the body. So if this tabernacle and Peter uses that phrase tabernacle over in the second letter to talk about his body. He says, while I am yet in this tabernacle. So he understood he was going to put that tabernacle off. That tabernacle was going to go to the grave. The Lord had already showed him, showed him that over in John 20, uh, 21. He said, said uh, when you're old, someone will lead you around, and then you'll die. So, for if we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So a house, a body, that's eternal. Well, he's not talking about this body as it is right now. In 1 Corinthians, he clearly shows the identity between the first and the other. If I put that squash seed in the ground... And then I pick that squash. Am I eating what that seed? Am I eating that seed? Yes. But it's not the body that was. And the body that was, the one that I sowed, is not the body that is. We can understand that. That's so simple. For in this, this house, this tabernacle, this earthly house, for in this we groan earnestly designed to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And so there's that contrast. Earthly, heavenly. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, you and I know what it is to be naked. It's to be without clothes. And so we got a couple of figures here. But to be without the earthly house is to be naked. All right, now I want you to get that. When your body is in the grave, turned to dust, your spirit is naked. Your spirit didn't cease to exist. Your spirit is naked. Now listen to Paul. For we that are in this tabernacle, this earthly house, do groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. The spirit does not desire to be without a body. These brethren who say that the resurrection is the spirit going straight to God and, and that's it, there is no body, are denying what Paul says here. He says that's not the desired state or condition of the righteous dead to be without a body. God is able to maintain them without a body. That's evident from Luke 16 and other passages. But the reality is it's God's eternal purpose that they should have a body. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality, the earthly, might be swallowed up of life, the heavenly. And so now we've, we've got that corruption, incorruption, flesh and blood, kingdom of God, earthly, heavenly, naked, clothed. When are we clothed? We're clothed after the resurrection. 
And it is not until we are clothed, now get this, it is not until we are clothed upon with the body, that is the resurrection body. It is not until we are clothed upon with the resurrection body that we are swallowed up of life. The naked spirit does not have eternal life. I wish I could get people to understand that. Your body without a spirit does not possess eternal life. You have the hope of eternal life. That's Romans 8, 24. That's 1 John. But you do not possess eternal life as a reality until the resurrection. And these brethren who are running around denying the resurrection, saying that we do not have a body, are denying eternal life. That, brethren, is heresy. And if I need to, I can attach an, ad an adjective to that. It is damnable heresy. It is unbelief because it not only denies what Scripture says, it denies the Lord Jesus Christ. It denies Jesus. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing... God hath wrought us for that. That's what our that's why we are in Christ. That's our end. Now he that hath wrought us for this self same thing is God, who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And the earnest of the Spirit in this passage is the promise that's contained in the gospel. The Holy Spirit has revealed all of this. This is the down payment. We have received the first resurrection, John chapter five twenty five. And the Holy Spirit has promised us the second resurrection, the resurrection unto life, John 5, 28 and 29. So Paul goes on to say, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. I can't be in the presence of Jesus as long as I'm in this fleshly body. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. See, this, this is what I said earlier. This is a matter of faith. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And Paul is not saying that it is the desire of man to be a naked spirit. What he is saying is, is that the desire of man is to be in the presence of God as he has purposed us to be, which is in this resurrection body. And that God is quite capable of doing that. And so he concludes there in verse 9, Wherefore we labor, that is, that's what we're working toward. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Know that your labor is not in vain. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to be pleasing to God while I am in the flesh, having received the first resurrection, in order that I can be pleasing to God in the eternal body, which is the second resurrection. Now let me go back here and address what our brother who asked the question originally last week is, is, is asking. So here's the question, and this is good. The Lord's body... Post-resurrection, pre-ascension. Was he raised with that celestial body or was his body changed at the ascension? Now, the only way to answer that question is with Scripture. So I'm thinking, first of all, about 1 John. 1 John opens his epistle, or John opens his first epistle saying this, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. What's he talking about? He's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not going back to the garden, because he wasn't at the garden. What beginning is John talking about? He's talking about the beginning of the gospel, when he and the other apostles were with Jesus. That scene in Acts chapter 1, where they are going to, to uh, nominate two men whom the Lord will, of whom the Lord will pick one to be the successor of Judas. And the criteria was he had, that he must have been with us from the baptism of John up until the taking up into heaven, until the ascension. And this is what 
John's talking, he's talking about this time, it says, that which was from the beginning. When we first began to walk with Jesus, and John was among the very first of Jesus' disciples. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, what did John see and look upon? And our hands have handled. What did Jesus say to, uh, to Thomas? Thomas, be no longer faithless, but believing. Reach hither your hand and put it into the prints of the nails in my hand. And take your hand and thrust it hither into the, to my side. Be no longer faithless. But believing, and when he appeared uh, to to the eleven without Thomas, and they were overcome with with joy and could not believe for joy. Uh, there in chapter twenty four, verse thirty six, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. What did John just say? It says, That which we have seen and that which we have handled. Handle me and see that it is I myself. What else do we have to say? Now just think of all of the... If Jesus was not raised incorruptible, what evidence do we have of an incorruptible, immortal body? No evidence. Plus, think about this. If the body that the apostles saw and handled in Luke 24 and the closing chapters and verses of John as well as Matthew and Mark, if that which they saw, that which they handled, that which Mary clung unto, all of these things that are described there, and, and they did not actually see and handle eternal life, the word of life, then pray tell me what did Paul see on the road to Damascus? Notice there at the very first part of chapter 15, this is important. Words have meaning, folks. So it says there that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, that's all of them, and then he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, 500 in one place, saw it, that's not a hallucination either, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some are fallen asleep. So if you need to ask someone, don't just ask the apostles, ask those who are alive among the 500 that saw him, at one time. After that, he was seen of James, that's the Lord's brother, then of all the apostles. So if he's talking about uh, James as an apostle, but he was seen again of all the apostles, and last of all, and I get it, last of all, he was seen of me also. Now go back through there. He was seen of Cephas, that's verse 5. Then of the twelve, then he was seen of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of above 500. And after that, he was seen of James. And then he was seen of all the apostles. And last of all, he, he who? He the same one that all the rest of them had seen. And if that's not the case, then Paul did not see what the twelve saw, and either the twelve are not apostles, or Paul is not an apostle. And so, 
obviously they saw the resurrected, glorified body. And that which they saw, to answer your second question, was raised fit for heaven. The scheme of redemption was not in jeopardy when Jesus came forth from the grave. They had killed Christ. They thought they had won him over. And Jesus was seen by many infallible proofs for 40 days, Acts chapter 1 says. And, it, and he was seen by hundreds of people, perhaps even thousands of people. And, and, and we're going to suggest that at any moment the Jews could have taken, taken him again and crucified him. If, if Jesus was not immortal, incorruptible, power, and what does is, what is, what is 1 first, first Corinthians 15 say? The whole point, I get this, the whole point down to verse 34 is that Jesus was raised, and then in verse 35, we're going to be like Jesus. So when it says it was sown there, when it says it was sown in corruption, it was raised in incorruption. That's true of the body of Jesus. Jesus' body was corruptible when it went in the tomb. It was incorruptible when it came out of the tomb. Miraculously preserved that it should not see corruption. Lazarus was stinking after four days. Jesus didn't see corruption. It was sown in incorruption. It was raised in incorruption. That's Jesus. When was it raised? On the third day. Not talking about 40 days later. It became incorruptible. It was raised incorruptible. It was sown in dishonor. It was raised in glory. When? On the third day, folks. It was sown in weakness. But it was raised in power. When was it raised in power? On the third day. And that's what the twelve saw. That's what James saw. That's what Cephas saw. That's what Mary saw. That's what the five hundred saw. That's what the women saw. That's what Thomas handled and touched. That's what John writes about that we have seen and we have handled. It was sown a natural body. The body that went in the tomb was the body to which Mary had given birth. It was a natural body, but it was raised a spiritual body. When was it raised a spiritual body? On the third day. If not, we got a serious problem with the testimony for the resurrection. What evidence do we have of a resurrection if the twelve did not see and handle the word of life? And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. When was the last Adam, Jesus, made a quickening spirit? Folks, it was on the third day. If Jesus wasn't changed until he went up into heaven, how do we know he was changed at all? This is absolutely absurd when we think about the consequences relative to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first man is of the earth earthy. Jesus was earthy and he bore the image of the earthy. But now the second man is the Lord from heaven. And as the earthy, such are they also that are earthy and is the heavenly such are they also that are heavenly. As is the heavenly. How do we know that he is the heavenly? How do I know that Jesus is the heavenly? It is I myself. Touch me. Handle me. We have seen. We have heard. We have handled the word of life. Well, folks, we're out of time. It has been a pleasure. I have enjoyed it. I hope you have. I hope I answered your questions. we got lots more things to study and talk about in the future. Don't 
uh, feel like you can't submit your questions early, always glad to get an email, Jeff Asher at Yahoo, or you can message me on uh, the Facebook uh, Bible Talk page or my personal page, and love to have any of those questions that you think you want to answer. Good to be with you. We'll see you next time, Lord willing.